Hello, everyone. My name is Teresa McConaughey, Executive Director and Counsel at the Canadian Environmental Law Association. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Walkerton's Drinking Water Protection Legacy. In this series, we commemorate the 20th anniversary of the contamination of Walkerton's water supply by speaking with the people who experienced the tragedy and the inquiry that followed firsthand. Hi, I'm Julie Mutis. I'm a journalist and former SELA intern. And during this series, Theresa McClenahan has been interviewing people involved in the Walkerton Inquiry. And today I'm stepping in to talk to her about her experience at the inquiry. With me today is Theresa. She is the executive director and counsel at SELA. And she was one of the lawyers representing the concerned Walkerton citizens at the public inquiry, digging into the direct and systemic causes of the contamination of Walkerton's water supply. Theresa practiced litigation and environmental law in a private practice for 13 years before joining CLA as counsel. She was a senior policy advisor to Ontario's Minister of the Environment in 2006 and 2007. Theresa returned to CLA as an executive director in 2007. She holds a degree in law from the University of Western Ontario, a master's in constitutional law from the Osgoode Law School, a diploma in environmental health science from McMaster University, and has just completed her Bachelor of Science in Geology, also Western. Teresa, thank you for being here and thank you for doing this series. Thanks, Julie, and thanks for all of your work on the series as well. It's my pleasure. Uh, so let's start out here. Uh, how did SELA assist the concerned Walkerton citizens when the tragedy in Walkerton first arose? So when um, the drinking water tragedy occurred in Walkerton, we received a call just after it became known that it was the water supply from Chris Peabody. And Chris actually today is the mayor of Walkerton. Um, he's also a high school teacher. And, and at the time he was involved in organizing a citizens group to respond to the tragedy. So they contacted us for, for help. And one of the first things we did, we were becoming aware that calls for an inquiry were going to be granted. So we sat down and helped them write a letter to the Attorney General. We sent it um, from SELA on behalf of the concerned Walkerton citizens uh, to the Attorney General and to the Premier, outlining what we thought would be essential in an inquiry to make sure that the uh, immediate causal factors were understood and also that the more chronic systemic issues were understood in the hope to prevent future um, occurrences of this kind of tragedy. And uh, we were, um, I think, able to influence the shape of the inquiry. I do recall understanding that they had delayed announcing those terms of reference while they um, looked at our correspondence. And then when they ultimately issued the terms of the inquiry, they very much did map against what we had um, requested. And um, we also uh, attended in Walkerton, I can remember being asked and going up to the community in those very early days to um, present at a very large town hall um, of hundreds of people in Walkerton about what an inquiry was and how it could help, why they would want to participate in it. Um, and uh, so that was a very um, important initial step too for us to assist the community to understand, you know, just what this legal proceeding would be all about. Mm -hmm. So CELA was in the community right when things began and you were also involved in the inquiry and everything that came after. Could you mm -hmm. tell me a little bit about what role you played during the inquiry and in the steps that came as a result of it? Right, so because CELA has a long standing um, area of work around protecting groundwater and surface water and drinking water and uh, looking at environmental regulation, Commission Council um, asked if they could sit down and speak to us prior to months, prior to the actual first day of hearing to talk about what kinds of things they should know about as commission counsel, what kinds of documents they should seek, what kinds of themes might be important. And um, then uh, in addition, once the inquiry was starting to take shape, I had done many long hearings. And so I worked with the rest of our team to make sure we divided up the issues by topic so that we had some continuity um, throughout the hearing on any particular topic. And I, along with Richard Lindgren, one of our other lawyers, um, dealt with the hydrogeology issues. 
And I also dealt with the uh, witnesses dealing with the health issues, with pathogens, um, preparing cross-examinations for those. Um, and then, of course, I was at the, at the hearing itself and at the end uh, played quite a large role in drafting our final submission and final editing um, to get the uh, document pulled into shape and, and back to the commission with our final argument, which argued for a multi-barrier approach. Um, and there were other things the commissioner asked uh, me to do. I can remember him asking me to meet with a family. Um, I can remember him asking me to help co-convene a workshop on source water protection, because at that time, the commission, which had convened a number of expert papers along the lines that you heard Jim Merritt discuss the other day, um, hadn't convened one on source water protection and they began to realize how important that was. Mm -hmm. So we ran that workshop at the University of Waterloo and that was very, very important part of the whole inquiry and um, gave me a lot of background to participate in the rest of the inquiry and in the years afterward. And your role in uh, the Ministry of the Environment, was that something connected with the report that came out of the uh, second part of the inquiry and Justice O'Connor's report? Yes, so during the um, inquiry itself, uh, we had two parts, and which others might have described. So the first part was dealing with the actual direct causation and um, the factors that led sequentially and directly to the events and the tragedy at Walkerton. Part two, Justice O'Connor set up to be about the systemic causes and, and how to prevent such an event from happening again in the future. So my role there was to represent the concerned Walkerton citizens in pretty much all of the part two proceedings to help with the drafting of a paper on public um, private water ownership that um, Justice O'Connor and his team thought would be important and, and asked us to work with um, QP uh, on that. Uh, attending at the town halls, the experts meetings, and then um, and even, uh, you know, responding to Justice O'Connor about one of our own papers and why why uh, he should um, follow the recommendations we had in that. Um, and then after that, I was appointed to a number of government advisory committees by the um, Harris government and then the Eves government and then the McGinty government dealing with nutrient management with uh, regulations for how to handle uh, manure on the landscape, biosolids, things like that, and then also around source water protection. And I spent um, quite a number of years uh, doing that work. And in 2006, um, was asked to go into the minister's office and, and work on implementing the rest of the Walkerton inquiry recommendations. About half of them were left to work on at that point and uh, to oversee passage of the Clean Water Act through the legislature. Thank you. So can you tell me a little bit about what it was like to go into this community that had just experienced an extreme trauma where seven people unfortunately passed away and there were many people hurt by this E. coli, uh, by E. coli in the water. Could you tell me a little bit about what it was like to work in that community and work with that community? Mm -hmm. The community, I can clearly remember the community telling me that they had really lost all trust in officials, in government, um, in the systems that were supposed to protect them, and um, in uh, the drinking water itself, of course. And so for me, it was really important to help them be part of getting to the bottom of what had happened. Um, and also to make sure that that trust could truly be restored. Um, the community was traumatized in those early days. As I mentioned, I was there very early. There were, you know, media trucks all over the place, which is not a normal circumstance for Walkerton. Um, as many have described in this series, the water was undrinkable. And uh, so bottled water was being supplied in huge, massive quantities. The um, Ontario Clean Water Agency had been asked to come in and, uh, you know, on a very urgent basis, set up an alternative method of drinking water treatment for the for the community. And there was a lot of um, uncertainty about what had actually happened because, of course, at this time, the inquiry hadn't occurred. We didn't have the evidence yet. And there were a lot of um, 
you know, concerns about whether the truth would, would come out and whether, whether we would actually find out what had, what had happened. So I do recall the emphasis by Justice O'Connor on ensuring the community could be part of the hearing. It was a very tiny hearing room. There isn't a large place to hold a hearing in Walkerton. So um, the commission arranged for cable company to cover it every single day. And much of the community watched those proceedings daily on the cable cast. Um, so much so that one day when we were all in Walkerton because we were already there, but the cable company was coming from Hanover every day and they couldn't get through because of a blizzard. So he actually canceled the hearing that day because he didn't want the community to be unable to participate and, and watch the hearing. Mm. And uh, the other thing I would say in terms of recollection is the community was very welcoming. Um, I would bump into people on the street while I was out walking in the grocery store. Um, you know, they told me where the nearest trails were. I love to cross country ski. So I went out sometimes if I had a few minutes after the hearing before I would start work in the evening to cross country ski on the river behind the apartment that we rented. Um, and uh, I do remember the community being the first to notice or at least willing to say that they saw that I was expecting my fourth child <laughs> and congratulate me when the lawyers in the hearing were being very careful to not say a thing as I was growing larger by the day. Um, and uh, my daughter is almost uh, ni 19 now. And I also remember it was a very snowy place and I grew up in the north and out west and I really appreciated that. And, and uh, there were still huge snow banks in June when I was going back there while we were working on the final uh, submissions to the, to the inquiry. Mm -hmm. So part of CELA's mandate is to ensure that communities have the ability to be involved in their facilitation of environmental justice. Can you tell me a little bit about um, how CELA sort of facilitated that through their representation of the citizens and how involved they were in mm -hmm. the decisions that were being made and the things that were being talked about in the inquiry. Yeah, so so the citizens were very, very involved. The um, uh, Several of the individuals were in touch with us daily, would come over to the rented apartment where we were working to help us work through the issues of the day and, and look at what was coming the next day, look at the documents, be on the phone with us, with uh, Jim Merritt, one of the interviewees in this series who was advising the CELA team and the citizens about some of the technical background that we were receiving. Um, they uh, were very much involved in, in deciding how we would shape the advocacy that we did, which was around a multi-barrier approach. Um, and in ensuring that uh, the voices of the public were always uh, front and center in terms of the of the advocacy. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, communities, we, we at CELA never do our best work unless the community is extremely involved in, in the matter. They know the issues, they have the local knowledge, the expertise, the passion, and um, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, capacity generally to, to make sure that the case that's going forward is, is the best one that we can. Mm -hmm. And the outcome of that case was a large recommendation for a, basically an overhaul of how we protect drinking water in Canada. Can you tell me what you think the most important legacy to come out of that is and how it plays a role in our drinking water safety today. Mm -hmm. So others in this interview series have spoken about the importance of the multi-barrier approach to drinking water and also about the importance of oversight and about um, transparency and, and public engagement in the water supply. And I would absolutely echo all of those uh, comments as well as the the fundamental theme that Justice O'Connor communicated, which is about the need for eternal vigilance about drinking water safety. Um, another key theme that ended up constituting about a third of the recommendations in the final report from Justice O'Connor um, deals with that first part of the multi-barrier approach, which is source water protection. And that's about keeping contaminants out of our sources of drinking water in the first place to make sure that there never is a, an inability of the subsequent levels, treatment and monitoring and so on to, 
deal with the safety of the drinking water. Um, and uh, it took many years to fully implement the set of proposals for source water protection, but it's an essential piece of the um, of the puzzle now in terms of providing safe water for most municipal water in Ontario. And uh, it's largely invisible, so it's easy to forget that it's there or not be aware of it. And, um, you know, we have to really be um, constantly vigilant still to make sure that that uh, level of protection is maintained right from source to tap, to use the phrase that we use about the system that we have here in Ontario now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's like you said, that's something that a lot of people are bringing up is the constant vigilance and also things that came out of this were just sort of an awareness in both the government and in the general community that you can't take your drinking water for granted and you can't become complacent. Mm -hmm, and exactly. despite looking at this as sort of the legacy of Walkerton, Ontario and Canada as a whole still has an ongoing problem with drinking water quality, largely in First Nations. Uh, and with some communities, uh, they've been living on boil water advisories for years on end. Why do these issues not get the same government response and attention as Walkerton did? And what needs to be done going forward to ensure that everyone in Canada has access to safe drinking water? Right. So Justice O'Connor spent um, a whole chapter of his final report speaking about First Nations drinking water in particular. And he talked about the fact that it's not acceptable for First Nations to have a different level of safety and that they have a right to expect the same level of safety as any other residents in, uh, in Canada. Um, so there are complex issues. The federal government did pass a safe drinking water uh, Act for First Nations a number of years ago, but it hasn't been implemented because it was very unworkable as um, passed. So the Assembly of First Nations has been working um, in more recent years on a new framework and has asked CELA from time to time to work with them on aspects of that um, new vision and new framework around source water protection in particular. This arises out of CELA working with a number of First Nations um, around developing source water protection tools and measures in their communities because, well, the provincial legislation here in Ontario allows for them to opt in to our Clean Water Act. Um, most of them, all but about three, have opted not to do that for valid uh, governance reasons. And so we at CELA with foundation funding and university academic expertise and the communities themselves have tried to come up with some paths forward and some, some toolkits. But um, the resourcing issues remain very um, troublesome and uh, some actions have been taken. There've been um, efforts by the First Nations, federal and provincial governments to deal with some of the most um, urgent issues. And, and some of those are starting and over the past few years have been addressed where some of those boil water advisories have been able to be removed but again because the more fundamental governance and resourcing issues are not yet addressed it means that it doesn't guarantee that that community won't be back on a boil water advisory in the near future when the problem um, resurrects itself again um, and uh, there are also a number of legitimately complex factors that any remote uh, rural and northern community has to deal with in terms of uh, running a system for a small number of people with a relatively high cost. Um, you can imagine if it's a fly-in community, you know, getting equipment in. Um, if you have a small population, you don't have very many people who are trained to run the water system, so it's difficult for the person to leave for more training. Um, so the Walkerton Clean Water Center, for example, runs a program to, um, it's called a circuit rider program to get people up into those communities to train them or to provide um, fill in so that they can get out for the training. So it's, it's pretty complex. We continue to work on it with our First Nation partners um, across Canada. And um, I know the governments do too, and the First Nations do too, but I think it's fair to say we have a long way to go. Teresa, thank you so much. This mm -hmm. video is a part of our series on Walkerton's drinking water legacy. Teresa McClenahan is the exec executive director and counsel at the Canadian Environmental Law Association. Thanks, Teresa. Thank you.